Welcome, everyone. This is the first session of our Beauvoir web webinar series 2023, brought to you by the International Simone de Beauvoir Society. Back in 2020, Marine and I started this project with the intention to provide a learning, learning avenue to mainstream Beauvoir, her life, works, thoughts, influence, even at the time of crisis. It anchors on the advantage of the capacity to communicate with people all over the world through online platforms like Zoom, which has been used since our first session in October 2020. In recognition of the fact that there is still much to be learned from Beauvoir, the second year of this project commenced and its third year is about to unfold. Since its first year, this webinar series has been focusing on the various facets of Beauvoir's thoughts, and Marine and I are grateful to all of you who have been part of these sessions. Now on its third year, the webinar series continues to provide learning opportunities for scholars, enthusiasts, and curious minds with three sessions of Zoom discussions with invited speakers and commentators. The first session for this year is on the theme Beauvoir in Dialogue with Asia, featuring three panelists and a moderator who are all from Asia because, yes, Beauvoir's thoughts go beyond cultures, places, and time. Thank you very much for your incessant support to this project, and we hope you enjoy the learning experience. So for this session, we have... Uh, invited the new president of the International Simone de Beauvoir Society. Let us all welcome Dr. Erika Runakowski for her message. Uh, okay, thank you so much, Gina. Uh, I am indeed the president since the beginning of the year and I was asked to say a couple of things about myself and, and about the conference that we are going to organize. I'm a senior researcher at the University of Helsinki Finland in practical philosophy. And this is where we are going to have the next uh, Beauvoir conference. And uh, the dates will be uh, from the 16th to 19th of August. And I hope that as many of you as possible will, will submit an article um, to this conference. And the deadline for the, for the call for papers or, or abstract submissions is the 6th of April. So we only have like two weeks before the deadline so you need to get going with the with the, with your abstracts if you, if you want to participate and um what else the, the call for papers can be found on the website and the topic is above uh, and post truth and all kinds of approaches uh to the theme are most welcome and you can for instance discuss uh, the possibilities of uh, existentialism in a post truth era you can analyze specific issues such as the rise of, rise of populist politics, information wars, uh, social media bubbles, uh, conspiracy theories, uh, artificial intelligence. And uh, you can analyze uh, existentialist concepts uh, such as bad faith or situation in the light of uh, current problems, or you can vice versa, use these concepts to clarify the problems of our time. <clears throat> and. Uh, uh, you can you can of course discuss uh, uh, literature, for instance, uh, autobiographies, uh, autofiction, and, and uh, uh, all kinds of fiction, and everything should be somehow related to Beauvoir, of course. So welcome uh, to submit your abstract. And if you are uh, if you have any questions, feel free to send me. Uh, an email, uh, you can find my address at the site of the uh, society, and uh, there in the in the call for papers, you can find another address which goes to the to my research group actually, and you can also contact me and and our <clears throat> our other um, researchers through that web mail. Sorry, through that email. So this is all. This was the message. <laughs> Thank you very much, Erica. So we have two weeks to submit our abstract for the conference, which will happen on August 16th to 19th. And did I get it right? Helsinki. Yes. All right. Thank you very much. Um, so 
uh, now allow me to introduce our guests for this session. I'd like to begin with Rafaela Elim Miranda, who is a lecturer at the De La Salle College of St. Benilde in the Lyceum University, Philippines. She's currently an MA in philosophy candidate at the University of Santo Tomas, our partner for this uh, webinar series. And her thesis is about Theodore Adorno's critical materialism. Alongside this, this, she is also completing two research projects related to feminism, particularly one on feminist critical theory and one on gendered experiences in academia. She has also worked as a research assistant and documenter for various NGO-funded research projects related to LGBTQ plus, I, IA plus inclusion, Sexual, sexual health and reproductive health, re reproductive rights and human rights. Let us welcome Rafaela Elaine Miranda. Can you please um, assist me in putting on spotlight Rafaela Marie? Next, we have Aya Nakamura, who recently finished her PhD in literature from the University Lumiere, beyond to France, with a thesis title, Becoming a Writer from 1945 to 1970, a Comparative Study of Three Female Authorship Postures, Beauvoir, Ledoux, and Ori. She has also studied in Japan and published articles on Beauvoir in Japanese. Friends, let's welcome Aya Nakamura. And the third uh, panelist is Earl Rose Ramirez. So also from the Philippines. Uh, she's a philosophy instructor at Sliman University, Philippines, and is interested in Beauvoir's philosophy. In fact, she's currently finishing her master's thesis on Beauvoirian existentialist feminism toward a critical analysis of the Filipino woman in bad faith. So we have Earl Rose Ramirez right there. They will be moderated by a colleague and friend from the University of Santo Tomas, Department of Philosophy, Faculty of Arts and Letters, no other than the chairperson of the Department of Philosophy, uh, EST Philippines. Let us welcome Dr. Marella Adam Mancinito Bolanas. So I now turn you over to Marella for the conversations on um, the theme of war in dialogue with Asia. Uh, good day. Uh, so yeah, so what I intend to do um, tonight is uh, just to give a brief introduction about uh, Simone de Beauvoir in Dialogue with Asia. And then I will be throwing in questions for our panelists um, and uh, they could probably take turns in answering the question. So let me just read um, a sort of introduction that I wrote. So the topic at hand is not necessarily new. However, I can say that discussions about this topic is still something that is one thing. We may have Asian scholars on Beauvoir or other scholars who try to see the interconnectedness between Beauvoir's work and the Asian experience, but these works still need to be exposed and or revisited. So in the Philippines, Beauvoir's works remain to be unexplored. For one, her works are not easily available in our local bookstores and libraries. For us to be able to read her, we need to buy her books from foreign bookstores and recently from online shops. As local bookstores only carry the second sex and sometimes the ethics of ambiguity, we do not have immediate access to her novels, let alone the secondary sources. From this, I can say the discussions on Beauvoir remain to be at the level of the academe particularly among the privileged few who can have or who have access to her works more specifically among the students of philosophy and the humanities. So back in the day, Beauvoir was only mentioned in relation to Sword and his, and his existentialism. There was not a lot of progression in terms of scholarship. In the University of Santo Tomas, from my personal experience, it was only one professor, Dr. Josephine Pasricha. Uh, she introduced the second sex to us, to her philosophy and literature students from the late 90s to the early 2000s. Being one of her students, I felt empowered after reading the text because for one, it was the first time that a female philosopher was introduced to us. So from this point on, more and more undergraduate students uh, started writing their thesis on Beauvoir. 
some have tried to critically engage with the text. Some try to see the connection be between Beauvoir and the Filipino experience. It is also important to note as well that with the continuous efforts of Gina and Marine in organizing the Simone de Beauvoir webinar series, we get to be updated with new publications. We are also given the opportunity to interact with scholars. And I can say that their project has tremendously helped scholars from this part of the globe. So today, Aya um, from Japan, Earl, and Rafi from the Philippines will join us to further understand and locate the influences of Simone de Beauvoir in Asia. So the first um, topic that I would want to uh, discuss or for us to, us, for us to address is that uh, whether there are existing translations of Simone de Beauvoir's works in your country and how are these books received by uh, the readers? Aya, would you want to uh, go first? Okay, um, thank you for the, the question. Um, in fact, the situation in Japan, I think, uh, is quite different from uh, the situation in the Philippines uh, because uh, Beauvoir and Sartre, have, the works of Beauvoir uh, and of Sartre have uh, been translated uh, in the 19, since the 1950s. And um, as I, uh, they had when they the couple visited Japan in 1966, uh, as Bovar tells in her uh, the last volume of her memoirs in uh, All Said and Done, uh, she speaks of her trip to Japan, and they were welcomed with a lot of enthusiasm by the Japanese public, and uh, because because everybody had. Uh, had known the couple, uh, had seen uh, them on, tele on, on on newspapers, and they were they were famous. They were treated like celebrities. Um, and in the fifties and the sixties, their books were uh, very widely read, at least among the intellectuals. And each of their books was translated almost immediately, and uh, they they were they were like stars, intellectual stars uh, for us. And um, uh, and and there and there's also um in in the memoirs, Bova mentions one of her uh, very good friends whose name is uh, Tomiko Asabuki, and who was um, the translator of many of her books, including um, uh, her memoirs and several of her novels. And um, she is uh, she's someone that has lived and studied in uh, France for a long time, and she lived throughout her life uh, in France and in Japan. Um, and I think she has studied even uh, before the Second World War uh, in France, which is very um, unusual because uh, at the time in the 1930s, uh, very few Japanese people could go to Europe, uh, let alone uh, women going to Europe in the 1930s from Japan, uh, that was very uh, rare. Um, and she has translated many of her, her novels, uh, Bob Bouvard's novels and her memoirs. She's also uh, known as uh, the translator of uh, Francois Sagan's novels. So, uh, uh, so she's someone that's very important for uh, introducing uh, French literature to the Japanese public. And um, uh, for the second sex, there have been two translations. Um, the first one came out in 1953, and I have them here in paperback format. I don't know if you can see. It came out in five volumes, and the uh, the weird thing is that they reversed the the two volumes of the second sex, and so uh, actually the the first three volumes is volume two of the original French edition, and the two last volumes is volume one of the French edition, and so. Um, the book starts with the famous uh, phrase, uh, one is not born but becomes a woman. And uh, but of course, putting the two volumes in reverse order also had uh, had problems because it 
kind of ignores the logic of the work as a whole. Um, that is to say, I think Bora's aim was to question the relevance of existing uh, studies and discourses about women in the first volume, and then to investigate the question from a philosophical uh, existentialist phenomenological point of view in the second volume, and reversing the order uh, kind of ignores this logic. But um, and the translation, this one also had its own problems because um, uh, there were errors uh, with the translation of philosophical terms, and um, there are also simply mistakes in translation of certain phrases. Uh, but in any case, this was quite widely read, I think. And shall I, shall I continue to speak about the second yes, translation? Yes, please. I, yes, please I, okay. Okay. Uh, the second translation um, was published in at the end of the 1990s, I think in 1997. And it's this one. And it was published by a uh, study group uh, within formed within uh, what we call in, in French, la Société Franco-Japonaise des études sur les femmes, uh, which is uh, the uh, Franco-Japanese Society for, of uh, uh, Women's Studies in, in, in Japan. And um, there was a study group within the society uh, that worked around the second sex for about 10 years. There were about 15 people collaborating in this group to read and to translate the second sex for, from 1988 to 1997 and uh, this translation is the fruit of the the work of these uh, researchers and uh, scholars and by the way uh, Beauvoir herself uh, is one of the founders of the society of uh, the Franco-Japanese society uh, of uh, women's studies that is to say, she agreed to lend her name uh, as a founder of the society in 1983. And uh, so this group uh, worked on the, the translation for a long time. And uh, so this is um, a collective work by uh, feminists in Japan working in French. Uh, but unfortunately, for some reason, this second translation has had been out of print for a long time. From around, I think, 2005, uh, this translation was out of print and it could only be found a second hand. And it, unfortunately, it became very expensive. And so uh, we were left without <laughs> uh, means to uh, access the book. But fortunately, um, uh, this year, in, so in uh, a few weeks ago, uh, the the book has been reprinted, and this is the the reprint. It's the same translation, but uh, in reprint by a different um, by a different publisher uh, this time. But um, and the, well, this is the first volume that has come out in March, just a few weeks ago, and there is going to be the the second volume that's coming up out in April. And so uh, the editors have finally realized that this is a book worth reprinting. And now it, um, it will be uh, accessible to the Japanese public again uh, in paperback format, which is, which is very nice. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, okay. just a quick follow-up, Aya. Since there is a translation of Simone de Beauvoir's The Second Sex in, in Japanese, can you say that um, in a way or the other, this has helped women's movements in Japan as well? Yes, I think um, uh, the first translation, of course, uh, had a lot of errors and um, problems as well, uh, which is uh, which have been pointed out by the translators of the second translation. But uh, nevertheless, I'm sure uh, I am sure that it has uh, helped the Japanese public to to access the the Beauvoir's ideas and her feminist thoughts and. Um, so, so yes, I, I think it has very much helped 
Yeah, thank you, Aya. Earl and Rafi, any thoughts? Um, let's do, uh, sorry, my voice is kind of weird. I'm, I'm currently in a coughing phase right now. Um, it's just so good to know that it's accessible elsewhere because, um, like what Doc Marella has mentioned, it's the, the conversations more and even, you know, the, the copies of the books are very limited, um, where we're from. I have a bit of a background in development studies as well and even there there are very few spaces that discuss the women thinkers that we discuss in philosophy um and it's 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 different to it's a different or rather it's it's really nice to hear that she's well appreciated elsewhere unlike in our context where we don't only lack conversations and spaces where we talk about Beauvoir, but even in our curriculum. Um, the idea of feminist philosophy isn't really um, prevalent. It's not like we don't have feminist subjects in most universities. Um, we don't also actively have or actively engage in these conversations. So the so you know seeing that it's different elsewhere is is very nice and it opens up the hope that hopefully we also normalize these conversations in you know our spaces in the Philippines. So thank you, Aya, for your work and sharing that with us as well. Thank you. Earl? Yes, um, on my end, um, I have tried to like say purchase it online because I think that's where commonly is accessible. But then when I mentioned it to my grandmother, um, she was actually willing to purchase one, an actual book, but then I said, I, she mentioned about the price, but then I just mentioned that um, I think I have to find other ways of um, accessing them rather than getting a, a um, she has to go and knowing that um, she's a senior, so I have to consider that. And so that's good that um, the translations at the same time of particularly the second sex, the book, the second sex, it, it's quite uh, accessible in my end, say the second translation, which I had a uh, second reading of that book. And it's quite really, I was, um, I was um, amazed of the thoughts there, the philosophical thoughts and how all of these ideas were being put just in one book with all the volumes. And so it made me realize a lot of things actually say here in the Philippines, especially that Filipino women, our orientation is patriarchal society. And so I think um, I would agree with uh, Rafaela that the translation of which that I mentioned was more like accessible in uh, her country, but here in the Philippines, I am not quite sure of that, but instead of checking online and then purchase them online. So yeah, that would be. Thank you, Earl, Rafi, and Aya. Um, I'm just interested, uh, Aya, going back to your discussion earlier, um, what was the impact of the first translation to the Japanese readers, knowing that it was in reverse form? I, I, uh, you've mentioned earlier that the latter part of uh, the second sex was placed at the beginning. Um, how did it affect uh, the reader's understanding of uh, the second sex? If if it affected, uh, yeah, it, was there an effect? Um, yeah. Um. I, I'm not a specialist on the reception. Uh, I think there are people working on that subject. Uh, so so um, I'm not sure what, what was the exact impact uh, of, of, the, the, of uh, putting the two uh, volumes in reverse order. But um, uh, and it wasn't only the second sex that was translated. There was also, for example, uh, Memoirs of a Dutiful Daughter, which had been also widely read, which came out in 1961, so only three years after the the publication of the the French edition, and um, and for example, the uh, one of the translators of the the second edition, who is uh, her name is uh, uh, Takako Inoue. She has written articles in French uh, on Beauvoir as well. 
but uh, she uh, says that she read uh, Memoirs of a Dutiful Daughter in 1961. She also read The Second Sex at the time, and the, the ideas that Beauvoir uh, had had a, a major impact on uh, her, her views of uh, her, her feminist thinking. And uh, so the, we do have uh, people, I think it's more intellectuals than uh, than than uh, or uh, university students that were reading her rather than the uh, the rest of the population, um, but um, I think the it was very widely read, uh, even though within a, a limited sphere, and um, and the another interesting thing I think is that the the relatively small impact that the second sex is said to have had on the women's liberation movement in Japan in the 1970s, because we also had a very big uh, second wave feminist movement in the 70s, which came right after the 1968, 1969 student movements. And um, so it's kind of like in France, we were very much influenced by the, the French uh, 1968 student movement and um but uh um the this the and but i think uh within the women's liberation movement in japan in the 70s Beauvoir was kind of considered too theoretical and too elitist um and maybe seen somewhat as having a condescending attitudes toward uh, other women um, which is a little bit strange, um, considering that the, the, um, uh, Betty Friedan's, the feminine mystique played a crucial role in the women's liberation movement in Japan, and her book was very much influenced by Beauvoir, but, um, Yes, yeah, so um, that this is all in the this the, the new edition that came out. Uh, with the new edition, there's a new post fest which describes how um, the second sex has been read in Japan. Um, and so, in the seventies, the the impact of the second sex wasn't as important, maybe as in other countries, but. Um, at the same time, it was read within women's studies departments in certain universities that were newly instituted in the Japanese universities. And because these um, women's departments were modeled on after women's studies departments in uh, American universities, um, and there Beauvoir was read. So I think um, uh, within the universities, it was, um read uh, yes yeah thank you very much Aya so uh earlier I mentioned that um what we do uh, as scholars in the Philippines so we try to appropriate uh some ideas of uh Simone de Beauvoir to our Filipino experience um I, I would like to know from our um panelists Rafi and and Earl, um, whether there is a specific idea from Simone de Beauvoir that uh, you have used already to analyze the conditions of women in, in our country. Aya can, uh, can answer as well if she has a similar experience. Earl, would you want to go first for Rafi? Right, uh, yes. So actually my focus here is on the concept of bad faith and analyzes the same conditions of women in the Philippine context. So bad faith here is characterized as say avoiding freedom or say not exercising freedom by neglecting transcendence because uh, transcendence and immanence are important themes in Beauvoir's philosophy. And so immanence are activities associated with women. These are repetitive activities. And transcendence is more on progressive activities, more like employment and labor um, services or economic and productive roles. And these, I focus on two situations associated with women. 
in Bevois terms, it's actually married women and motherhood, or as a wife and a mother. Like say, um, these these feminine situations tempt a woman to bad faith. So say, for instance, like in a married uh, life, a married woman, marriage is said to be not on the conditions where a man and a women have the same rights. In a traditional uh, marriage agreement, a women's primary role is to attend to house chores and say take takes care of children, or in other words, she is restricted or confined to imminence. And aside from that, she must resign from all other life interests, basically because of her primary role. And um, when it comes to motherhood, like say pregnancy and motherhood, they are actually believed as a women's um, natural vocation. However, Befo clarifies that human society is not about one's nature, but rather how it is shaped, how it is formed, or how it is established. So in, in pregnancy, for instance, what happens here is that a woman's experience, what we commonly know is like the morning sickness and childbearing makes her increasingly weak. So here without any question, the core of her existence is actually justified, which is the womb. And so before asserts that these feminine situations, say for instance, motherhood is a situation that limits a woman's freedom. It basically traps a woman in the sphere of imminence. And you know, traditionally imminence is recognized as a women's so-called work. So basically I am focusing on bad faith and trying to, the, the, this perception of a Filipino women condemned to imminence that is displayed in domesticity and childbearing, it's actually the same concepts of uh, Beauvoir. So that explains the influence of the patriarchal orientation in the Philippine society's long established roles expected of women as they become wives and mothers so yes yes uh, earl i agree no uh yeah i think even up until this time uh the situations of some women in the country remain to be uh the same right uh yeah unfortunately right uh earl you've mentioned about uh Bouvois' uh, concept of um, situation, I think uh, Rafi is also doing uh, something that is uh, similar. R Rafi? Um, yes, uh, thanks, Earl, for sharing that. Um, what I'm interested in, particularly, is the concept of situation. And as we all know, Bouvois, um, we're, I, I guess, personally, I'm attracted to the, situ to the idea of situation because it recognizes uh, the materiality of woman with her body, um, her history, and the people she surrounds herself with, and how this creates her perceptions of the world, and how this shapes her understanding of the world. In particular, I'm interested in understanding how this concept of situation, or how we could use this concept to understand particular dynamics in the Philippine context, like what was mentioned earlier. You know, it's very, the discussions on Beauvoir, especially these concepts, you know, they're very limited to academia. In our experience, we've had reading groups, for example, for Amanon Garcia's latest book um, this past year. And the discussions uh, were something that we relate to, you know, the ambiguity of submission under different circumstances. And then it led me, I guess, to ask the question, to what extent can these situations um describe the experiences of women um, in the Philippines. For example, as we all know, we're not that economically developed. And us women scholars are very few, and we also live in a state of relative privilege compared to our counterparts, for example, who don't have access to formal education. And um, since my interest is also in critical theory, I'm also interested in understanding that situation to come up with, you know, ways of uh, or emancipatory possibilities that are coming from those specific margins themselves. So I guess, you know, the concept of situation could help us understand the dynamics in the Philippines insofar as um, if you look at a woman's body, for example, it undergoes what Earl said, different states of labor, but her condition, her history, her family, and her cultural upbringing 
has different perspectives on that. For example, if you're um, a privileged middle class person and you're looking for to forward to having your first year child, your first child, or you've established your family, that's that event is something that you're celebrating. But if you're part of the Philippine poor, if that's your twelfth um child, and abortion is not legal in the country, there's no good health care or child support, that your perception of the situation, how that situation impacts you is very different. Um, and uh, in my re recent research project, I was looking um, looking to use this concept of situation to understand precisely um, marginal Filipina situations. But I felt as though there were limitations in how it can explain power relations in my country. Um, and as I mentioned, since I want my project to be faithful to these the experiences of these women, even if Bubwa provides us a philosophy of what she calls lived experiences, because it can't account for, or the, the contextual limitations cannot account for these power dynamics, I shifted to another, um, what's this term, another philosophy to help explain it better. Um, so in short, I really appreciate the idea of situation and it's it's contextually relevant to some aspects of Philippine society and some experiences of Filipina women. Although I'm not entirely sure if it can fully account um, for the plurality of other experiences that, you know, that even sometimes I have the skepticism that feminist theory in academia can account for. Uh, yeah, Rafi, in your research, um, were you able to encounter already a way in which you could reconcile Bouvois' philosophy with the current approaches in women and developmental studies? Um, currently, I haven't. To kind of also share what I've learned uh, in development studies, a lot of them use frameworks of intersectionality. Um, in the Philippines, a lot of the philosophy that we do is really theoretical. It hasn't intersected with, you know, different approaches from different disciplines. And it's, you know, in, in a way, it seems divorced from development studies as a whole. In development studies, for example, they use like different interview methods and qualitative methods to surface the experiences of women. And um, if it, it, it see, Beauvoir's philosophy seems too theoretical to kind of apply in these specific contexts, um, some of the like close to uh, or some of the methods they use that are very close to philosophy in in the recent project that um I did uh, I wrote a, I wrote uh co-wrote a report rather for one of the um one of the NGOs in the Philippines related to sexual health and reproductive rights and for there for example we use the framework of intersectionality from Crenshaw um, for Kim from Kimberly Crenshaw and um to some extent Patricia Hill Collins reconceptualization of intersectionality. Um currently I haven't really found a way to reconcile it yet. Um as well as I haven't but I credit that to the fact that maybe I haven't explored um fully or I haven't mapped fully, you know, this concept of situation. Um I'm hoping to do that once I finish um one of the projects that I'm currently doing, um, but it's it's very interesting. I I my relationship with Bubwa is similar to um, Mama Morales because, um, like her, it was the first woman philosopher I was introduced to, and I think that there's so much to learn, um, especially with the new literature coming out. Like for example, um, fields that haven't been explored is the dynamics of culture and submission. Um, in relation to Manon Garcia's commentary and things like that. So, so far, I haven't really reconciled it, but hopefully, um, if there's time and energy in the future to pursue this, um, I can also do that as well. Yeah, thank you, Rafi. Earl, um, I'm, I'm curious about your research as well. Uh, you wanted to talk about um, uh, motherhood and, and um, bad faith. Um, how, I, I'm interested to know how far are you already in your in your research and um, what are the tentative findings that uh, you've gathered already? Oh, okay. Um, so far in the Philippine context, there is actually 
a study conducted. There are actually a lot of studies conducted, particularly like full-time mothers. Why do they say resign from work since um, most of their answers are because of the influence of patriarchal um, uh, roles? Like say, um, since she is restricted or Filipino women are restricted at home, she does not focus much on activities outside the home, which uh, in Bevo's terms, um, projects and creativity or that is uh, through work. And so in the Philippines, uh, uh, a study uh, titled Determinants of Female Labor Force Participation in the Philippines examines the factors of um, labor force participation simply because uh, Filipino women neglects her work for wife and mother roles. So, so far, like I've, I've read narratives of which why they have to um, resign from work. Uh, one mentioned that because they could not conceive uh, so her husband tells her to come to terms with quitting her job whenever he finds one. And so she realizes that and she eventually gets pregnant. That is one. So um, the idea here is the wife apparently chooses to end her career to build a family. And then another family oriented um, women mentions that she has been a regular employee of a particular company. But because she has children, she has to. Uh, she was compelled by her husband to choose between work or children. That is, of course, her primary role is to focus on staying at home, tending to household chores, and even taking care of the children. And um, in due course, they actually experience financial difficulty, leading them to live miserable lives. And what happens is that she blames him and he blames her, which uh, in Bevois terms, if I can remember it correctly, um, she blames him for creating it and he blames her for accepting it. And the third one is uh, one of which a wife confirms her reason for abandoning her work is because her husband wants to arrive or come home to his wife. Like say, the wife further explains that her husband would frequently get mad for not preparing meals for him. Hence, the uh, she conforms to the social norms in which um, Traditionally, uh, Filipino women, they are so strongly attached to, say, patriarchal attitudes, like, say, um, one, there are actually three, if um, I could hopefully enumerate all three of them, uh, based on the Filipino cultural values that uh, women firmly believe. The first one is to abandon one's needs for the good of the family. And then the second one is to continue the traditional ways of saying teaching their children to obey rules or codes of behavior. That's why um, boy, young boys and girls display different behavior patterns. And then the third one is to preserve the roles of women as wives and mothers at home. So truth be told, um, Filipino women could not somehow depart from these established values because they believe these norms should go together well for a family to achieve harmony. And so that's actually the reason why they are strongly tied to patriarchal attitudes. And it's kind of sad because um, uh, the thing here is they only know the restrictions that their their role is for eminence and not to transcend because it is what the the society dictates it is what the patriarchal society would um, want them to do or expect rather so um, that's actually the so far the findings i've which and at some point um, to realize her individuality and achieve liberation in society, Bevo actually um, shared her proposal or demands for the society, women and men. So all of them as much as possible, we have to say uh, mutual recognition. We have to um, treat each other as equals and not as um, women as the other or um, inferior and that men as superior or um, so yeah basically that's that's one of uh, so for the findings based on the readings of 
uh, Befoua and then um, further studies of Philippine, uh, say, probably that was, I think, uh, the Gender and Development um, Program through which uh, the title, which is the determinants, uh, the factors basically why women are, they, they have, say, little to no interest or less interest of um, working or participating or engaging in the workforce. Thank you, Earl. Aya, do you have um, a similar experience in Japan where um, scholars try to appropriate particular ideas to a uh, Japanese experience? Are there um, publications uh, gearing towards that method as well? Um, so, so you, do you mean, uh, so scholars speaking, uh, can you repeat the question? I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, are there scholars in Japan who are making use of the same method, say, uh, making use of a particular idea, uh, coming from the works of Simone de Beauvoir and try to apply it to a particular, uh, experience of Japanese women? Um, I think, uh, of course, as I have said, um, Beauvoir's works have been read throughout the, uh, the, the years of, uh, since 19, the 1950s. So, and there have been scholarly work on, uh, the subject. And of course, the, the feminists working with Beauvoir's works have always, I think, been trying to um, use her ideas to think about the situation in Japan and to improve our situation in Japan. But um, um, I haven't, I, um, I haven't known that many scholars my generation in in Japan. So I don't know if um, if uh, younger people in Japan. I mean. The people that have read it in the 60s, for example, or in the 70s ha would have uh, different ideas about Beauvoir than I. So I, I'm not sure if what I, I'm saying would be a representative of any, any uh, um, of, of the Japanese woman's perception of Beauvoir. But um, I have the impression that um, a lot of the problems that uh, came out after the Second World War, that is to say, in the well, maybe with the second wave feminist new movement, haven't been uh, solved in Japan, and um, I think, in, um, of course, there have been uh, improvements uh, with the with women's situation in Japan. Uh, in the in I guess in the eighties and the nineties, there have been uh, changes. But um, the government today is still extremely conservative. And um, uh, we, also, we often say that Japan ranks uh, in 2022, 116th in the global gender gap report. That is very low. Um, so we, we, ha we have uh, uh, the sexism in Japan is um, at least when compared to other G7 countries, or, you know, we, we have an extremely conservative government, and um, the ideas that come from uh, them um, are, they give us the impression that what Beauvoir has problematized in the second sex have not really been, been solved. Um, and uh, politically, uh, feminists in Japan have been facing challenges since I think since the turn of the century, the beginning of the 21st century, with the backlash um, that gained momentum, and the and since the I think at around 2000, since around the 2000, the conservative forces have been occupying powerful positions in the government, and um, so um, I think yes, the, that's the general situation in Japan, and. Um, they, of course, the government no longer encourage women to stay at home. I mean, 
uh, in the 50s and the 60s, after the uh, World War II, what um, um, and historically, um, uh, well, the Japan was democratized in 1945, and gender equality was spelled out in the new constitution that was established right after the war. Um, and Japan was also economically growing at an incredible speed. But at the time, um, women were expected to be good wives and wise mothers. That's the expression that we use in Japanese, good wives, wise, wise, wise mothers. And um, so they were expected to, to give birth to children, stay at home, and, and tend to house chores. And so in that context, in the 50s, 60s, it's... Um, I, I think it's not that different from France, first of all, and it's understandable that Beauvoir's ideas of, of the independent, transcending woman appeal to a certain part of a uh, certain female population in Japan. Um, but uh, today, I think the the problem is that what, uh, well, as I've said, what was what was said by Beauvoir, uh, the problems that she has posed have not been solved and of course we're no longer told to stay at home but then there are women that would prefer to stay at home uh, rather than work outside because you know wages are often low and economically uh, we, even when women work they are often in very precarious situations and um and today, given Japan's extremely low birth rate and the problem of the aging population, the government is always trying to urge women to bear more children, and they are failing to do so. But um, yes, so we do, I think, have the, the, the same sorts of problem in, in, in Japan. And in that sense, Uber's, uh thoughts are still relevant to, to, to in considering these questions and problems. Thank you, Aya. So yeah, with, with what you've mentioned, would you agree that um, uh, the people in the academe probably have reaped benefits from the second sex, but not yet, uh, not yet, uh, but the rest of the population is yet to um, probably uh, understand, or, yeah, but but the rest of the population, um, probably, but I, ideally, uh, ho and hopefully, uh, in the well, I'm not sure how, how to phrase it in the future, but yeah, but the rest of the population is still, you know, uh, uh I don't know how to phrase it without sounding a bit elitist, but yeah, hopefully, everybody gets to read Bova. I think that's what I'm trying to say, um, and uh, uh. Read Bouva and um, yeah, get the same empowerment that others who've read her uh, get that same feeling. So yeah, uh, um, uh, Gina, do we still have time? Or, yeah. All right. So uh, any uh, yeah from Rafi and Earl, um, any reactions to what Aya just discussed? Um, yes, well, I think uh, the same with what um, Aya mentioned. I, uh, I believe it's uh, one of the many issues. And like say to add up uh, the recent like global gender gap review, particularly uh, the Philippines, it is actually ranked 17th um, with say 78.4% of the countries like say trying to really settle with trying to solve the um, issues. However, it's kind of say shocking to learn that particularly women's engagement in the workforce is continuously um, low. But I think here in the Philippines, in terms of its population, I think we don't have, um, say, overpopulation. We we are, but in terms of women's participation in the workforce, engaging in 
uh, say projects and creativity, it's quite still low. And still the same reason is the social norms of providing care for the family and household tasks. It plays actually a vital role in stopping from uh, women to participate in the workforce. And I think I'm not quite sure um, if Rafaela would uh, also agree to that. But um, I think that is one thing that I have observed. And of course, based on the say reviews of what the government, the Philippine government is actually trying to um, resolve or solve in, uh, in addressing the concerns of gender gap. Um, uh, thank you, Earl, and thank you, Aya, for that. Um, yeah, uh, that was actually one of the key points of um, some of the researches that we had done. We are trying to assess, for example, um, given that the Philippines is number 17th in the global gender gap, um, you know, rating, wh why, what other, or why doesn't this translate necessarily to public policy? Um, I guess I, I would agree that there are very limited avenues for mothers and um, married women should they decide to focus more on child um, rearing in the Philippines. However, I'd also um, like to share that there are different ways by which um, these women find, you know, creativity and develop their projects. For example, um, I worked on a project that involved an organization called HomeNet in the Philippines, which focuses on um, helping uplift women in the informal sector, specifically home workers. So um, I'm not entirely sure if the researches related to working women include these aspects of the informal sector, but from the findings, it seems that, you know, it's a way for them to engage in projects. For example, they make arts and crafts and different um, uh, departments that support this would source their products from these women. They make anything from dishwashing liquid to, you know, um, knickknacks that they distribute to different persons. So um, I guess even in the absence from the workforce, uh, what's interesting in Filipino culture is that they still try to find ways to pursue different forms of projects, even if it's, you know, even if it's just to support their families in the little ways that they can. But it's undeniable really that there are so many forms of um sexism, misogyny, and similar to what I mentioned, a lot of the problems that Bubua experiences um, still exist in the Philippines. And it's very, it's a very interesting thing to think about, given that we rank allegedly highest in Southeast Asia um, for gender equality. Um, and hopefully, uh, I'm not entirely sure about the logistics because, um, you know, the particularities of the context mean that there are a lot more people who are not really you know, literate, we rank very low in literacy and math ratings. So in terms of the logistics of our desire to have everyone have access to the text, I don't know how that plays out, but I also share in that aspiration that um, through the text and through other feminist works, um, women can also explore these other avenues, but maybe also at the later time when there's less structural inequality, and they don't have to worry about, but Earl also mentioned, you know, um, having to feed children, having to like focus on these tasks because there isn't really much support for that. Again, thank you. Thank you, Rafi, Earl, and Aya. Uh, final thoughts, Aya? Rafi and Earl? Uh, okay, um, just a final word. I think um, um, I mentioned that politically speaking, um, the, the perspective is not necessarily very optimistic, but um, I think the changes in Japan are more sort of noticeable on a cultural or a discursive level. 
um, because more books on feminism have been published in the recent years, um, especially since the, the Me Too movement. And, um, and more, we have more books that are accessible in Japanese, whether they be uh, translations from other languages or uh, things written by Japanese feminists. And I'd say that the, the publication in the last few years of Bovar's writings, the reprinting of the second sex, as well as the translations of, we have also they have the translations of um, uh, Les Inseparables, the, the Inseparables, and of uh, what, the, the, I don't know, uh, the Le Malentendu à Moscou, um, Misunderstanding in Mos Moscow, uh, which is a novel of, um, a short story by by Beauvoir. and we also have a um, a feminist magazine called uh, Simone, which came out in uh, I think into published in two thousand nineteen, and of which uh, the first issue was a special issue on Beauvoir, and in which uh, collaborated members of the translation study group of the second sex as well as younger feminists and both scholars and writers outside the academia and um, this is the, the magazine Simone the, it's named after uh, Simone de Beauvoir and also uh, I think uh, Simone Veil which uh, there are two Simone Veil's, the one with the V and the one with the W, but the two Simone Veil, and um, the the so the the magazine was named after those uh, Siri Simone, and uh, and it's a feminist magazine. So I think on a cultural or you know on a discursive level, things are more uh, uh, changing more noticeably, which um, which might be a more sort of an optimistic view um, and I hope that this would not just be a trend that uh, would disappear in a few years after me too but um, yes uh, I, I hope that this would continue and um, um, probably uh, an encouragement uh, for women and men to engage in say because here in the philippines we have a lot of women's movements and really trying to address um, concerns of like um, gender equality and so um, if hoping to try to engage or to at least read uh, before the second sex in which we, yeah, I, I find it really an eye opener because it may be harsh, you know, the thoughts there might be harsh. Um, the philosophical inquiry, the, the say the terms may be difficult because of um, technicalities or technical terms, but really you would appreciate, uh, we, we would, I, I personally, I appreciate Beauvoir's thoughts and it made me really say, would use it like an ugly truth or, or, or a harsh truth because it it somehow it somehow makes sense, and I mean we can observe them in our environment or our uh, society, and so probably an encouragement would also be best to at least uh, bridge or somewhat um, settle the gender gaps here in the Philippines because of patriarchal attitudes. Yeah, so I guess that would be all. Thank you. Thank you, Rafi. Thank you, Earl. Um, so I guess from my end, I'd like to also share some hopes, particularly in spaces where we can maximize this impact and make a change. Like, for example, in the Philippines, we've already mentioned that a lot of the discussions of Pope was thoughts limited in academia. And even in the spaces that we occupy, for example, particularly in philosophy, it's, it's, it's an uphill battle to even normalize discussions on feminism. With the inception of our recent um, organization for women philosophers, women doing philosophy, we've created more and more spaces where we can talk about feminist issues, um, feminist philosophers, and we're developing that consciousness to highlight as many women as possible. And I think it's important that in, in these spaces, we also, you know, continue our discussions on Beauvoir, start um trying to find ways to make these thoughts even more relevant in our situation. Um, it's not to say that I've lost hope in, you know, allowing 
the people, for example, that I would like to do my research with and on, which are, for example, women in the margins, say um, that there's a, this big gap that we don't really have a clue on how to solve. Um, but hopefully in our flourishing as women philosophers and in our engagement with different spaces in philosophy, we can find a way to begin that conversation. If they don't have, if they can't access the primary text, at least the hope is that we, um, you know, as women doing philosophy um, in such a way that tries to analyze our particular situations, we can begin to create spaces to have these discussions and to surface their own experiences in relation to Bouvois' ideas, even if indirectly. So thank you. Thank you, Rafi, Aya, and Earl. So yeah, just to try to summarize uh, what we have um, discussed so far. So um, we can say that um, the scholarship on Simone de Beauvoir in, the con in, in Asia, um, in Japan, uh, there are already translations of uh, various works written by Simone de Beauvoir. Uh, in the Philippines, there's none yet. Um, but in terms of scholarship, scholarly publications um, in the country, uh, there has been a lot of um, works which tries to appropriate the works, the ideas of Simone de Beauvoir to the Filipino experience, and the same is the case in Japan. But one of the challenges that we have been experiencing is to try to um, try to bridge the gap or uh, try to connect the disconnectedness probably in some of her theories with our own um, experiences in in our in our country I think um, yeah so I think that ends the discussion um, may I ask the audience uh, if there are questions for our panelists Yes, Mariel. Hi, thank you so much for all of this. It's been very informative to me. Um, I just wanted to add a footnote, which is that um, when uh, Rafaela was talking about how the methodologies of feminist activism uh, or work in development tend to be more empirical and more, you know, survey based or based on interviews. Um, I don't think Beauvoir would have had a problem with that. You know, I think it's 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 worth. Um, I mean, we all see the the distance between theory and life between philosophy and 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 practice you know in in every country we see we see that um though she saw it also you know and one um uh the 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 parts of the the second sex it's full of facts and figures you know we tend to skip that because it's old right but um and and the 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 book about China, as weird as it is, even even more so, um, you know. Uh, and, and she said she wished she had done more of that kind of thing. Um, so, you know, we might be glad that she didn't, that she gave us something else. <laughs> but she certainly. Um, so I think it's possible for that aspect of one's work to also be inspired by her in a in a non it's not a contradiction there so thank you Rafi would you want to respond um thank you Maria for that actually that's what's you know that's what makes me want to continue exploring the idea of situation because it feels very malleable right it feels like in some way because she promotes this philosophy that considers where we're coming from especially, for example, um, as a woman of color, it feels as though there's somehow, some way, um, uh, uh, like it's redundant to keep saying way, but a means for us to look at what we're experiencing through the framework that she's, that, that she's developed. Um, it's, it's not, of course, she can't really, she could have never anticipated the kind of context that we have. And even up to now, right, there's a lot of, 
people trying to say that her thoughts aren't relevant because they're not specifically contextually applicable. But the spirit of looking at where we are and, you know, how we experience inequality from the point of view where you experience that um, that pain, that kind of sexism, that structural injustice. Um, I feel like there's a lot of potential there. Um, and thank you, Mariel. I'd be happy to explore that sometime in the future because, you know, there are also very limited people um, that that explore Beauvoir specifically in our context. So thank you for that. Thank you, Ravi. Erika? Thank you. I, I found this discussion really, really interesting. And it came to my mind, like in, in Finland, where I'm from, uh, the first, um, uh, the, the second sex came out for the first time in 1980. And actually, it was a shortened version. Uh, it was like um, only half of the material. But but I think it was <clears throat> kind of not such a bad, and the same happened in Sweden. Uh, it was not such a bad move to make it somehow like more condensed and more popular and more accessible to to everyone everybody because somehow you know when you read only the short version then you just feel okay this is it moves you a lot but then if you just have like a thousand page pages in your hands it's it all of a sudden becomes so, much more of a challenge to go go through it. And actually, I was one of the translators that we were three people who translated it for the second time and, and in, in entirety. And it was a huge job. It came out in 2009 and, and 11. But yeah, so I think there's a point to, to having that kind of cut versions too. And I think it was published quite uh, with, well, it was done for the purposes of women's movement in, in Finland. So, and it served that purpose. I think it was read quite wi widely. Um, okay, but um, yeah, so that's what I wanted to say about about the publication history in Finland. But but also I, I had this question about um, other fe feminist scholars in, in Asia or like, which scholars would be those or which philosophers or other thinkers would be the popular ones in, let's say, Japan and, and the Philippines nowadays? Because, of course, Bobar may not be the most obvious uh, thinker when you think about the whole, whole uh, scale of, of feminist philosophy. And, and sometimes she's thought of as somehow outdated, which I think is completely wrong. But of course, there's some some material in the second sex, for instance, which is which is a bit outdated. But yeah, so so my question to you is like, what other uh, feminist thinkers are popular in your countries nowadays, if any? Um, may I answer first? Yeah, go ahead, Rafi. Okay. Um, thank you uh, for that sharing as well, um, Erica. So far, um, I think in our case, um, in my exposure with philosophy, um, a lot of, of the women that I've encountered, um, for example, like Mam Gina and Mamarela, they do um they do Beauvoir. But there are like one of the other popular um, feminist thinkers that I've encountered my colleagues um, using or reading rather is um, is Iris Marion Young. But we also have a program um, in WDP in Women Doing Philosophy where we have um, the we call BTG sessions or Beyond the Ghetto sessions where we are trying to increase our access and our knowledge about women philosophers um, through having different webinars. Um, for example, um, so far in my spaces as well, um, in some of the philosophical projects that I'm doing, we uh, the, one of the popular ones is Patricia Hill Collins and her idea of intersectionality, as well as we're also dabbling into um, decolonial feminist thinkers um, like Spivak. There have been reading groups about her works as well. And um, which uh, we've also been exploring um, in my space, for example, uh, Bambra's philosophy um, and her 
her criti- feminist criticisms of critical theory. Um, but I think Earl also has um, insights, and I'm also interested in understanding how they do feminist philosophy in their spaces because we um, we teach in different parts of the country, and there might also be different trends. Um, since it's not the, the network that we have is not entirely centralized. Um, I I believe uh, I'm too focused yet for now on Beauvoir's philosophy. Actually, I have I think I have to read more of her works. Um, aside from the second sex, some ethics of ambiguity and other like say critic or um, like say arguments of other say uh, scholars who are also interested in Beauvoir's philosophy. So. Um, in my case, so far, I, I wish to further my understanding on Beauvoir. And yeah, I also know um, Dr. Gina Opiniano and um, Dr. Marella Polanyos, who also is uh, tried to, I mean, say published, I believe, with works uh, engaging Beauvoir and the same interest with Rafaela. So that's basically on my end. Uh, to more readings of Beauvoir's work, not just uh, the famous ones, which are um, the second sex and like the ethics of ambiguity. And I think there are other readers or there are also other scholars. Um, I think that was the other night. I just found a different, say, interesting um, study, but I wasn't able to read the entire which because I just I also want to like say understand the themes like say this is how he understands bad faith this in in a particular situation like say in old age uh, on my end it's on like motherhood and um, what well, um, married women and probably others to come if they wish to engage on the same themes of Beauvoir. So I, I just wish to further my, say, thoughts or um, philosophical inquiry about uh, Beauvoir's philosophy. Thank you, Erica. Aya? Um, in Japan, I think I would say that everything that uh, is done in English speaking countries is imported relatively quickly in Japan. So, and it, um, in in the academia, but, but also outside the academia. And so, um, in fact, um, um, I myself, for example, when I first, when I was in, in I don't know, um, in Japan, in my university in Japan, before my master's degree, I read Beauvoir because um, uh, because someone had ta- told me in class about uh, Torres Moy's book, The Making of an Intellectual Woman, and uh, that it was one of the first books that I read on Beauvoir. So it didn't even come from uh, I and I myself was in a French studies department uh, and uh, learning French and learning French history, French philosophy, French literature, but I also was in an interdisciplinary um, environment. So I also had uh, other courses and it was uh, one of these other courses uh, in which um, I was introduced to uh, Beauvoir and her, her work. So it, it's and um, so I would say that, and the, the book by Tora Moy wasn't uh, translated by uh, people working in French philosophy or French literature, it was translated by uh, people in the English department. So um, I would say that everything that has to do with English is imported rather quickly. Uh, and um, when it comes to uh, feminist, uh, feminist thought, um, and um yeah so i was in a, in a french department but i think it's it's uh um it's not uh, uh but i would say that yes uh, when it's done in english it's it comes in very um fast um uh, right, then then faster than when it's done in french um and 
Uh, Vulvar has an interesting uh, comment about uh, Japanese intellectuals, uh, about the Japanese intellectuals she met in 1966. And she says, um, in all, thing, uh, all said and done, she says, in particular, to defend themselves uh, against the influence of America, whose policies the government embraces, but which is very unpopular, especially among intellectuals, they, the Japanese intellectual, make a large place for French culture. And so, um, in other words, um, everything that's American comes uh, very quickly, whereas, uh, but uh, French culture also has had a great impact on Japanese intellectuals, and which, and which is why probably uh, Jap Bobo has been uh, read in Japan over the years. So, you, uh, yeah. yeah, if if I may just add also um, to try to answer Erica's question on uh, who are the other feminist thinkers that we read in our country. Um, uh, well, just to give um, probably a background. So at the beginning, it was just Simone de Beauvoir during the 90s and the early 2000s. But there is a growing number of scholars who are working on feminism at the moment. And so it's as if um, we, we try to put our hands on all the other readers uh, or all the other uh, feminist thinkers that we encounter. Like, for example, um, Gina, in one of her classes on the history of philosophy, she tried to introduce uh, Greek uh, women thinkers. Um, in my class on the history of uh, philosophy and we uh, modern to contemporary, I also tried to um, I also try to include other um, women thinkers uh, during in that particular um, period. Um, and uh, very recently, last semester, um, we offered, uh, it's long overdue, but we offered um, an introduction to feminism as a course in the undergraduate. So that's, that's a development, uh, knowing that my department is a 400-year-old um, philosophy department in the country and it was just um last semester that we offered it as as a course so that's uh we're yeah so we yeah so if in if in japan uh anything that is in english is easily um adapted or easily um uh yeah easily uh easily adapted there i think in in the philippines it, it takes a while but once we get a hold of all these materials um, we just end up consuming more, more and more. So yeah. So yeah. Thank you, Erica. Um, are there other questions from the audience? Can I continue just a little bit? Yes. Yes. Go ahead. I I just wanted to say that uh, I don't know if I got it right that the Japanese um, that in Japanese the second volume was sort of published first and then the first volume of the second sex. Yeah. So. I was thinking that that may be one of the one of the reasons why why Bovar tends to move us so much uh, as readers is that she brings out such a huge uh, amount of and and variations of women's experiences. Um, so that uh, and and at the same time she analyzes this in an interesting way. And and what you you have well of course the sec the second volume is called the lived experience so that's kind of maybe maybe an easy place to start if you are not a philosopher or or, or other other kind of scholar uh, whereas the first volume is a little bit more theoretical uh, but yeah I, I I'm I sort of well when I was listening to you I really had this uh, kind of deja vu feeling from my own youth, like when I was first reading Beauvoir and how, how impressive it was uh, just to read it, even though, even if I didn't agree with everything, but there were so many things that resonated somehow. So I, yeah, I think this was really interesting to hear you speak. Thank you. Uh, yeah, so I think at this point, I'll turn you over to Marin and Gina. Yeah. Merci beaucoup. Thank you very much. Uh, so, sorry, uh, we are nearing the end of uh, of this first session of the the, the Beauvoir webinar series, and uh, I would like to thank the speakers for a fascinating uh, conversation that I think has raised many interesting avenues to 
um, to explore. But before announcing the next session, I would just like to share some short excerpts from letters that Beauvoir received from Asian female readers, because they go in the direction that um, what has been said today. So I'm going to share the screen, or maybe Gina, you can help me share uh, the slides. So it's easier to read the letters and uh, it will be very short. Uh, so for example, there's, there's this uh, letter in 1959, a Chinese woman writes about the second sex uh, among books dealing with similar subject as in Le Deuxième Sex. There was none as exciting as this book, which I was able to read without becoming bored. This book was our salvation and we can only bow our heads to your wonderful genius. When time is heavy on head, I read it over and over again. Um, so to put this letter in context, um, in September and October 1955, Beauvoir and Sartre were invited by the government to visit China. And back in Paris, she, uh, Beauvoir began uh, writing an essay on the country. It's the long march. We, um, we talked a bit about that. Uh, it was published in French in 1957 and then was uh, translated into English in 1958. And one of the most recently published an analyze of Beauvoir's view on China is perhaps Mariel Altman's uh, chapter Beauvoir in China from her book Beauvoir in Time and also Margaret Simon's paper Beauvoir's Long March. I don't know about the Chinese translation of the Long March, but um, the first Chinese translation of the second sex only appeared in Taiwan in 1973 and in China in 1986, according to uh, an article, a very interesting article, by the way, by Liu Aiping. Uh, so Beauvoir, it shows that Beauvoir was known, but read in English at the time of this uh, very letter. There's another letter um, in uh, 1959 and in 1961, uh, two Japanese women uh, wrote uh, also in English, but the two of them refer to the mandarins, uh, which they read in English, apparently. Uh, and Beauvoir also traveled to Japan many times, as I uh, mentioned during the, 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 the session. And there are also very interesting works by Julia Bullock. Uh, I think she left, but uh, she attended uh, most of the, the, the session. And uh, she wrote a lot about the translations of the second sex in Japanese and also about the reception of, um, of the book. So those letters suggest the importance of travels and translation, of course, um, in the, uh, the diffusion of Beauvoir's work and more widely in the circulation of uh, ideas and especially feminist ideas. And there's another letter uh, and it's the last one I'm sharing with you. Um, I think it, it is interesting because it's written by a female Korean uh, teaching French in, a Kore in Korea, in a girl's school. And she announces to Beauvoir that uh, she wants to translate uh, the second sex into Korean because um, I am sure she writes that your book will be very useful to restore the culture of my country and to civilize the Korean woman who have only a short history as independent. Um, now, th this letter also, I think, encourages um, the colonial critique of the reception of Beauvoir's work outside of European uh, countries. For example, there's this very interesting articles by the Malaysian sociologist Syed Hussein Alatas who uh, analyzed in 19, uh, during the 70s, but in fact, she, he analyzed European cultural and uh, epistemic um, in hegemony in Asia, and he invited to question it by identifying the agents of the diffusion and the circulation of ideas and by making a decolonial critique of these processes. And uh, in this article, he uses the example of teachers. So that's, that's why this last letter seems um, very interesting. And there are many others waiting to be explored in this direction as the speakers uh, suggested um, too. So yeah, I just wanted to share with you uh, the existence of those letters and uh, the possibilities of research and uh, analysis that uh, they, they have. Um, so I'm going to stop there um, and announce the next session. So we will meet again on April 28th, 
uh, for a session dedicated to Beauvoir as a literary theorist. And we will host Toril Moy and uh, Ashley Few. Uh, so thank you for being with us today. Uh, we hope to see you again next month. And um, good evening and uh, have a wonderful day wherever you are. <laughs>